why don't we get started? So I just want to say welcome everyone in this extremely cold day. Um, mm. It's good to see your faces. And we have, um, I'm not going to jinx the agenda. So I'm just going to say we have a, um, a, a good agenda. And we're going to start with talking about inclusion, support, and pig abilities. And that's Sharon and Ann Myers. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Ann, do you want to lead off or would you prefer that I lead off? You can share it and then I'll kind of share about uh, the meetups. That'd be fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And thanks so much for having us. Um, let me begin by saying that I'm Sharon Hannon. I'm the marketing director for Ohio Valley Goodwill. And for the seventh year, we are so proud to be the title sponsor for an event called Pig Abilities. And that's going to be taking place on May 6th at 12 noon. And that is an event fully accessible and welcoming to athletes of all abilities within the Cincinnati Flying Pig Marathon. And as you may or may not know, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Flying Pig Marathon. So it's kind of a really huge deal in the greater Cincinnati community. And we're so excited to be part of that. And this year, as part of that celebration, we are really trying to work diligently to get the word out to all possible interested athletes and coaches and cheerleaders and volunteers, whomever, to register and be part of the Pig, Abil Pig Abilities event uh, and join us for the big celebration this year. Our goal is to get 1,000 athletes uh, to participate this year. Uh, last year, we set a record with almost uh, 500, right? Yeah, yeah, almost 500. So it would be almost, you know, a 50% increase. And I realize that's a lot, but we have complete faith in our county board partners to help us with getting the message out and making sure that we reach as many people as possible that may be interested. And I believe that Karen, we sent you an updated flyer with all the registration information um, about the Pig Abilities event. Is that, is that right? Um, I believe I only have the one about the flyer meetup with the running group. Oh, okay. Well, then I will follow up and send it to you, okay? Okay. All right. And I'll just turn it over to Anne because we are so grateful to Anne. She got involved this year and is uh, setting up some training meetups, which we're super excited about. So, Anne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, every Sunday, starting this Sunday, February through May, we will be meeting um, at four different locations around Hamilton County from 2 to 3 p.m. So anyone's welcome to join with their family, with their support staff, with their friends. And we're going to be doing anywhere from quarter mile to mile routes. All the routes will be accessible. Um, our four meeting locations are the Hamilton County DD Services Office on Madison, Auto Arm Leader Park, um, LeBlond Rec Center, and Friendship Park. So on the meetup flyer um, has all the addresses, but again, it's from two to three. Um, it's just a great way for people to get together and socialize while also doing something active. Um, you can connect with other people there and we'll have water afterwards so we can stick around and chit chat, but everyone's welcome. So please share this with anyone that you're supporting so that people can start joining us um, this Sunday. And if for some reason it's bad weather, you can always check our website and it says it on the meetup flyer and we'll let you know, like if for some reason it snows and we can't, you know, get outside on the sidewalks, if it's not safe, we'll post an update on the website. So we hope you can join us. And like I said, that starts this Sunday. You don't have to register. You just show up. Um, and if you can't make it every Sunday, that's fine. Just come when you can. And we'd love to have you there. And we're partnering with, um, Queen City Running Club. It's a local running club. So there'll be some Queen City Running Club people there as well. So we're going to do this as a joint effort. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. Well, I appreciate you letting us come and speak with you about that. And then I have one more inclusion thing to also offer up as well. Um, that's not pig abilities related. Um, but if you're supporting anybody that um, you know is having trouble finding things to do or places to get connected, um, and even if you have staff who maybe aren't sure um, you know where to go or places to find for people, 
I'm a community navigator at the county and uh, me and the other community navigator are happy to help out. So if you have any staff that um, you've heard that are struggling to help find people uh, or find places to connect in the community that are free, low cost, or even things that do cost money, we are happy to offer that support. So if you want to reach out to us, all you have to do, um, I'll put my contact information below. All you have to do is send me an email. I'm happy to talk with your staff and um, help you help the people find some places where they can go so they can meet some other people that have similar interest. Well, thank you, um, Ann and Sharon. And um, Ann, that really is a wonderful service that you offer. And um, it can you know, range from a really small involvement to even more um, uh, intensive involvement, depending on what the person's need is. So I really, really appreciate your work. You have so many stories of people being connected and um, making friends, which I think is super important. So um, thanks for that. And um, Ann, is, the referral process is super easy. So you email Ann, <laughs> basically. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Take care. Take care. So um, Karen's going to move on to state updates and um, DSP retention payments. Hi, um, just a few short things. As you know, um, the rule passed in late 2022 about the 6.5% for the DSP retention payments. And then agency providers had an opportunity to opt in through the middle of January. And I am happy to report that the providers that opted in covered 96% of claims. So I think that's tremendous and a huge amount. Um, and as a reminder, this the 6.5% covers eligible DSPs that work in the field um, up to 50% of their time. And then these payments have to be documented, sent out to DSPs in the form of uh, bonuses by the middle of March. Um, so we are still receiving additional information on this and um, how to support providers, but DODD does have a page with additional information. Um, in the chat, I have included um, a link that covers sort of a FAQ of how to process and document um, where the retention payments are going. Um, I did receive a direct question, is that 96% of Hamilton's county or statewide? My understanding is it is statewide. Um, have you guys received your payments yet? They should have been directly. Okay, great. Uh, so if you opted in or if you're an independent provider, you are automatically opted in. If for some reason you did not receive your payment, I will look for that um, email address so that you can reach out to DODD directly. I'll put that in the chat once um, we move on the agenda because I can't do it right now. Um, I also want to give you an update on Hamilton County's Workforce Sustainability Program. As you know, the last date to submit the overtime request for reimbursement was yesterday. And to date, we have processed just over not, almost $1 million, so $914,468.93, which I think is um, tremendous that we've been able to commit to doing that. Um, the longevity add-on for um, DSPs that have been um, in the field at least two years and completed the 60, 60 hours of continuing education, that competency-based longevity add-on is gonna continue through the end of 2023. So if you have eligible DSPs, um, make sure that um, they look into that so that they can get the $1,000 bonus. And that's for DSPs that are providing HPC services um, because they can, the um, residential provider can build the competency-based longevity add-on for additional um, HPC reimbursement. All right, and I got a clarification that um, providers were emailed their approval, but the money may not have come in yet. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? I don't think I have anything else that I want to share. Jamie, do you have an additional update beyond what I know? No, I think you covered it pretty well. Great, I'm shocked too. <laughs> All right, up next is um, Jen, who's going to talk about some waiver and Medicaid updates. Good morning, everyone. I don't have a whole lot for you today, which is probably good news to most of you. It's not often I come and share like exciting and fun news. Um, but just two things, two little things. Um, these were already announced, um, but I just want to make sure everyone was aware. The first one is about billing. There had been a provision in place that you could do Medicaid billing. There was an additional 180 days in addition to the 350 you're allowed from the date of service to bill. The department has announced that the Ohio Department of Medicaid is removing the 180 day additional window. So just be sure to make sure your billers are aware that 
all claims have to be made, including adjustments, um, within 350 days of the service. I think most of you do that in general anyway. Um, every once in a while, I think there's a lot of strange things, but just want to let you know that that, um, that 180 day extra um, extension has been removed, effective today, actually. So just making sure you're aware of that. The other thing, uh, which is strictly Medicaid related also, um, while the PHE has been extended, the public health emergency was extended again until April 11th. And I actually saw something, Jamie, I know you sent it out that there's a likelihood it'll be um, terminated in May. But as of right now, the official announcement from the state only takes it through April 11th, um, which for waiver, we'll have an unwinding period, which I'm happy to talk about if anyone wants to. But the one thing I want to make sure everyone was aware of, this was new news we just got <clears throat> in the last few days. In Ohio, they have used a federal regulation that was passed that allows them to do something. I've, I've never heard this word. I didn't make it up. D-link. They're going to delink Medicaid from the public health emergency. So the moratorium on Medicaid disenrollment will be terminated. Effective April 1st, JFS will be running cases, meaning they will start disenrolling people who don't follow all the rules and meet all the criteria for continued enrollment in Medicaid. I know I've mentioned this here before, but for those we are the authorized rep for, we've been monitoring this really closely. And I think we're in decent shape with those folks, although we do have some people we're worried about. But for those of you who manage people's benefits and are in charge of their money, you need to be looking at whether or not they have been compliant with all the rules because Medicaid has been just simply renewing people's Medicaid. They've not been disenrolling people, even if they don't comply with renewals or they don't meet the criteria for renewal because that was part of the federal agreement for states to get the additional monies. They had to agree to have this moratorium on Medicaid disenrollment. So that's coming to an end, April 1st. Medicaid will start, or JFS will start running cases as usual. I will tell you that we are very, very concerned about people and how many people are gonna be out there that do get disenrolled. We are aware there is a huge queue of people who didn't turn in what they were supposed to during the last three years, essentially. And as soon as that goes live, there's going to be a trigger pull that puts them in the process for disenrollment. So our benefits team, I mean, they only have four people, so they're not able to handle every case, but they are able to help advise. If we're the auth rep, we will handle the cases and take care of any appeals that need to be made. But if you are the auth rep for someone or you work with an individual whose family is the auth rep or maybe they're their own auth rep, you need to be watching for any of these Medicaid termination letters. And immediately what you need to do is appeal because once you appeal and request a hearing, they cannot disenroll that Medicaid until the hearing takes place and the decision is made by the hearing officer. So we have a one pager, I'll ask Karen, I'll get a copy of it over to her to share with all providers, <clears throat> excuse me, but our benefits team has put together a one pager on the steps to take if you get one of these letters. So if I could ask all providers to be on the lookout for this, and remember, the, we're, we're concerned for lots of reasons. We don't want people not to be able to get their medical care, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me. But from a provider perspective, you need to be aware if they lose their Medicaid or their Medicaid goes into the DISE status, disenrolled status, we call that, they're going to not be able to use their waiver. So if we, we can work together to keep an eye out and help educate um, individuals and families uh, that are the auth rep, and if you are the auth rep, make sure your people are looking at this. You got a little bit of a window here. Um, you need to be reviewing people's accounts. They're going to be looking at both income and assets. So remember, we've had a lot of people who got extra money during the pandemic, and many of them have not spent that and are over-resourced currently. That's the biggest issue we're finding, people being over-resourced. And remember, if they are over-resourced, you need to make sure that they're spending those funds the way they are permitted to and that there's record of that. So we can't just withdraw cash, and put it somewhere. We've seen that. Don't do that. Um, don't advise people to do that. That's a problem. Um, if you have any questions about what's legitimate, what's permitted, if you have any need for setting up stable accounts or other types of trust, our benefit reps are absolutely there to help um, guide you on that. Um, Di Sunderman would be your main contact for that. Um, Karen, could you share her email in the chat? Yeah, I'm actually going to link to the provider newsletter because we covered this a little bit in there with yeah. some helpful forms. So if you need access to that, it's going to be in the provider newsletter along with Di's um, email address. We also have a taped um, session for the stable account. If you have families that are interested in learning more about it, and that's on, um, I can send the link to that. I'll put it in the chat. And we are finding this is the case more often than you might think. I was quite surprised to see how many people are in this situation in terms of having either not turned in what they needed to to Medicaid over the past couple of years. And I think, you know, if, if you're a family member, I can understand why you might have just not realized anything was wrong because you're just getting letters that say you're approved. Well, you're approved, but in the background, they put you in a queue that says, you know, 
Karen didn't cooperate, didn't send in what she needs to. So she's in line to be terminated. That's what's happening. So I'm trying to put this in the best lay terms I can so you can help explain this to families as to what's going on. Um, and then cases are gonna be run as normal starting April 1st. And there's lots of people who are not gonna pass the checks because they have too many, too much in terms of resources. Or I think it's mostly resources. I'm not seeing a ton of income issues. It's mostly resources, money sitting there that needs to be appropriately put into the right types of accounts or used in the proper way so they can still be eligible for their benefits. So I hate to be doom and gloom, but I'm, I can't emphasize enough how worried we are about this. Um, and the one pager that we created, I think will help in providers or families on what to do if you do get one of these letters. And I'll be honest with you, they're quite confusing. We're opening 15 to 1,500 to 2,000 pieces of mail every couple of days at our office. So I know families and providers are getting inundated or will be here soon with mail. Um, and the mail is super slow. So by the time you get that letter, I know we're getting them 10 to 12, sometimes 15 days after they're mailed, which is already pretty far into the process. So you have to act on them immediately when you see them. So I hope I emphasize hey, that enough. Yes, Jamie. More doom and gloom. I mean, pay, hey. be prepared for your staff to fall in the cliff effect. You know, if they've been getting Medicaid yeah, and then and then he started working for you or whatever, and, and obviously all of our staff are working lots of hours probably making more than they've ever made, um, you know, they could fall into this. So I worry about that too. People Yeah, leave Jamie, that's a really good point. Everything. You're right. And we have been hearing that as well. The other thing, since you mentioned that, I wanted to mention, Jamie, because we, we've, we've been hearing this is going to affect both individuals and a lot of staff as well, especially those with families. SNAP benefits are going back to the standard level in March. So people might be feeling like they're getting something cut or taken away, but they're not, they've been getting an enhanced amount during the pandemic and that is going away. So they're gonna be going back to the standard amount starting March 1st. So here pretty quickly, you're gonna be seeing that occur. So you might wanna make whoever's managing, you know, food for the homes or managing people's um, benefit cards, make them aware of that as well. Mindy, did I see your hand go up? Did you have a question? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, there. real quick. Um, and it may not be a big deal, but I know that it happened to a couple of our people. We went over a little bit, opened up the stable account, but I do have a question. Do you know if they are going to go back date and look and ask for those funds back um, for those people once this they, goes into effect? They will absolutely go back um, okay. at least a year. They might be going back further. That we're waiting for guidance on. Um, Di was trying to get her hands on that and I got something from her. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So she may have that in terms of how far back they're looking, but I know they'll go back at least a year. So what you'll need to be able to prove if you're the auth rep helping the person through this is that if you did open a stable account, you know, what funds went in there and that, you know, you offered, offered, you know, open the right kind and that the right kind of funds went over there. Worst thing you can do is just take that money out, right? So you want a paper trail of where it went. Yeah, we had a couple of parents who were supposed to be like involved and it just took them a long time to respond. And that's why we yeah. went over. So it's one of those things that's, yeah, no, but I still don't want to, them to get absolutely. stuck. We're hearing that a lot too, and people are not understanding it. It is taking a long time for them to understand and get these things in place. Um, and we really, we need to start acting on them now because unfortunately April 1st is gonna be here before we know it. And I'm, I'm very worried about what's gonna happen to people. We do get a list just so you know, for a while we weren't getting it. We are getting a list every month of people who are in the process of termination. So, you know, that hasn't the April 1st people haven't started rolling through yet, but we just did get a list this week. So we've been informing um, all SSAs and we're asking them to inform providers um, that we're starting to see this happening. So I anticipate that list growing longer and we will reach out. Um, if we don't see any action, we get it on the list and we see no action close to that termination. We're also going to be reaching out to providers. So we'll reach out to you as soon as we possibly know there's a problem and try to get you involved in helping, even though you may not be the author rep. We just might need your help explaining to people and helping them really understand the rem ramifications if they don't resolve these issues. So I had two super fun agenda items, but they, they weren't long. Um, did I miss any questions in the chat, Karen? I haven't really been looking at it. Nope, nothing. Great job. Okay, yeah, reach out to us if you guys run into any issues. We'll do our best to help you and partner with you to not have these problems happen. And my best advice is appeal, appeal, appeal. Because once, once you're in, once you request a hearing, you're in a stay and they can't do anything until that stays resolved. And my this is just my opinion. This is not Hamilton County. My personal opinion is there's going to be such a huge influx of requests for hearings that they're going to be pushed out so far because they're not going to be able to handle the volume. So we'll see if that happens. But that's so that'll help you is my point, uh, because they're not going to, be able to do anything while you're in that stay. 
So the hearing is going to become really, really important. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. I'll go ahead and talk about sort of the OISP Brick Code trainings that we have going on. Um, today, Mandy Spiller, who's with us and one of our reviewers, she's sort of our expert on Brick Co. Um, she will be hosting a training at 10 a.m. to cover the um, what the OISP is going to look like, what revisions will look like, um, for plans that are still in Gatekeeper, but we've transferred over to BrickCo. And then she'll also sort of cover a little bit about documentation. Um, if you do happen to wanna to come to the training at um, 10 a.m. today, just use the same link to log on to the provider forum. So it's the same link information. And then we also have um, a duplicate training on February 16th at 1 p.m. Um, if you want to share that link or attend, um, there's a survey monkey where you can sign up. Um, we know that probably, we know you're busy, so we know that not everyone, even with the best of intentions, you may not be able to attend these dates. So we are recording them and we'll share them. And I will show you, I'm gonna share my screen and show you where those are located. Um, also, last month, we did a few general use trainings for BrickCo. So if you, you guys can see my screen, I'm assuming. And I'm on the provider page, hamiltondds.org backslash providers. And then if you click on this training link, we created a folder for the OISP and BrickCo. So if you just click on there, sorry, it has the information that we have so far. So the general access training for independent and agency providers, and then also the recording today will be added and handout information. All right. Um, any other questions? Just as a reminder, we are transitioning to BrickCo officially on February 21st, so three short weeks away. Um, that is a Tuesday, and you may be wondering why we're transitioning to a new system on Tuesday. We are off that Monday for President's Day, so that gives us um, an extra day to do the data dump and transfer everything. Any questions or any needs from your end, things that we're not covering that would be helpful? Um, I did want to mention that we know things aren't going to go smoothly entirely as much as we hope for and much as we plan. Um, and so we are going to be hosting a session in the middle of the year to talk about what needs to change, what can do better, what are the struggles, um, and just have sort of frank conversations about um, what needs to happen so that our system's better. So I will be sending out a survey monkey to sign up for that um, early in the spring. That's all I have. Thank you. Hey, Karen, this is Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, obviously, the state of the state of the state address was yesterday with the governor. Um, does anybody on this call have any updates on uh, the governor's budget as it relates to the DD system? And was there any positive news coming out of that? Uh, not from the state of the state, Mark. Uh, DD wasn't mentioned uh, by okay. the governor, um, but I, I I watched it twice. Um, I know it's like um, putting nails in your fingernails. Or yeah, yeah. Um, but I did watch it. And he he didn't mention DD. However, behind the scenes, we're pretty hopeful that the budget's going to drop today. We hope. And the blue book. The blue book was supposed to come out Monday, and and I yeah. had not heard that it fell, but. You're right. It's, I it's, think it's supposed to drop today. That's my understanding. Okay. All right. If it hasn't okay. dropped already. And um, we should see an increase in DD funding from the governor's budget. Um, what that'll be, it, it's all kinds of guesses. Okay. You know, I'm hearing between 5 and 17%, somewhere in, in there. That's so a that, huge variance. Yeah. So it could, you know, and so just so everybody knows what happens then. The governor drops his budget. It, now you turn to the legislature and the House and, and House committees will start rolling it up. And and that's where the real advocacy comes. Um, yeah, I, I, I will share with you guys here in Montgomery County. I've contacted Pamela Combs, the superintendent here. We are actually having um, three or four providers here in the Montgomery County area pull together. There are four representatives uh, like Bill Plummer is a pretty significant cog in the state government. Uh, legislation. So we're trying to get 
times together where providers can come together and have the, your local representatives come together. I'm asking on this call, if any providers would want to help support that, contacting our local representatives in Hamilton County, they need to hear from the providers, our DSPs. Um, and if anybody wants, maybe Jamie, you and I, and Cindy, obviously this is a gold standard conversation as well, but the, the reality is if we can get a, a designated day um, to get some um, uh, representatives in Hamilton County boots on the ground to really hear our stories. I think that might be beneficial uh, for our local politicians. Yeah, I know through Opera, we've obviously identified all of them um, and working on that, but that might be a, a that's a good idea, Mark. Maybe we can, yeah. And if anybody has a relationship with any of our electeds in the state government, um, Maybe, uh, Mark, do you care if you, they can call you and we could set that up a little bit? Yeah, I'm at, I'm, obviously, I'm, you, I know you're affiliated strongly with the um, opera. I've got Ohio Healthcare, Pete Van Runkle. Um, he's actually been helpful for me to identify those individuals. Um, you know, just because there's, you know, like for instance, in Montgomery County, I've got four representatives just covering the core of Montgomery County. Hamilton County is going to be similar or larger, um, but it's who those individuals are and what uh, committee and, and what involvement they have at state government is where you really want to target individuals. So I can work with Pete and identify the people in Hamilton County and then get back with, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Jamie, or, or Gold Standard Group, and then we try to get some, uh, uh, if we can get some people in, that would be great. Yeah, that's always helpful, for sure. Okay. Mark, I do know there's a parallel effort with families and advocates um, to be up at the state and because, uh, I, you know, Sometimes you can move people with the the stories of the families and their experience and how important that's the best to, way. Yeah, yeah. So I know that that's um, active, and we yeah. have local representation. Okay. Okay. Any other announcements or things that, uh, for the good of the whole? Okay. All right. Well. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Please remember we get a 10 o'clock session with Mandy um, on the um, Britco OISP. So um, please join us then and have a great day. All right. Bye, everybody.